Okay, now let me see if it works. Yeah, there we go. Ah, so we got got it. So the reason was the use of multiple monitors. So we learned something new. Yes, uh, and a big thank you to our viewer Marcel, uh, who indicated uh, us to the right uh, uh, fix to this. So now I will uh, shut up and uh, leave the stage to you, Professor Xu, and uh, we'll be listening to understanding whole plant water relations through a physio functional approach. Okay, okay, thanks. Thanks to everyone. And apologize for the technical issue. And uh, especially, I, I would like to to thank the um, um, one of the audience who um, provided the solution. So yes, you are genius. Thank you very much. Um, today, it's my privilege and the pleasure to have this opportunity to present some of our recent work on the uh, plant phenomics uh, upon the uh, invitation of IPPM. Uh, as just uh, introduced by Philip, my talk title today is Understanding Whole Plant Water Relations Through a Physiogenal Functional Approach. First of all, please allow me to introduce myself and my team. My name is Pei Xu. I'm currently a professor and a dean at the College of Life Sciences uh, at China Jiliang University, which is located in Hangzhou city, very close to Shanghai. Uh, I'm also currently serving as the vice chair of the vegetable legume section of the Chinese Society for Horticultural Sciences. So I just moved to this university three years ago so as you can see from this picture, my team is very, very, very young. And the research in my lab focuses on plant phenomics, vegetable legumes, including common beans, cow peas, peas, garden peas, and also the improvement for quality and the safety traits of these important vegetable legumes. So now let me introduce the concept of plant water relations or PWRs. PWRs concern how plants control the hydration of their cells. We know that plants take water from the soil through their roots and the water are transported within the plant and get lost by evaporation from the leaves. There are several important parameters to uh, define the plant water relations, including water, uh, relative water contents in leaves and roots, transpiration rates, stomatal conductance, GS, etc. Specifically, stomata is the gateway of both water outflux and the CO2 intake. So it is critical to balance between the yield and the drought tolerance of a plant during water stresses. And the ratio between um, carbon fixation and the transpiration is defined as water use efficiency. However, the PWRs are among the most difficult traits to phenotype partly because of the complex properties of the soils in which the plants grow, the rapidly changing atmosphere status, which is um, tightly related to the plant shoot water status, as well as the interaction of drought with other stress factors. It is even hard to define a desired drought resistant plant, for example, for example, for non-crops such as Arabidopsis, so we frequently use survival rate as an index to reflect drought resistance. But this may not work for crops such as tomato because for crops, 
adjoint resistant genotype needs to behave less yield loss during soil job. And this type of drought resistance is called agronomic drought resistance. It is more related to plant breeding. In order to better phenotype the plants, there are several phenomics approaches uh, have been developed, including the morphology-based phenomics, biochemistry-based phenomics, and the physiology-based phenomics. Morphology-based phenomics uh, are the most widely used currently, and the trace it can measure ranges from plant density, plant height, to uh, chlorophyll content, canopy temperature, very wide. But here today, I'm going to focus on physiology-based phenomics. In one of our publication in uh, 2021, we proposed the term physiologics to refer to physiology-based phenomics. The platform we used uh, to, to do to perform physiologics analysis is the plant array system, which is co uh, commercially available from an Israeli company named Plant Detect. The plant array system consists of high throughput sensors and a sophisticated data analysis pipeline called the Spark. Uh, here shows a single unit of the plant array system. And uh, a lot of units can be aligned together to form an array. And the number of the units is, depend, is dependent on the demand. Can be a few until hundreds to thousands. So it purely de depends on the demand in your study. The system allows for high throughput, non-destructive, continuous, and the simultaneous measurement of plant and environmental parameters. These plant parameters can be simple parameters or complex derived parameters. For example, plant weight, transpiration rate, and the stomatal conductance are among the relatively simple traits. But critical soil water contents and the slope of transpiration declining are among the complex traits. So let me just explain a bit more on the critical soil water content. It means the soil water content at which a plant starts to close its stomata. So it is a very important indicator or index to reflect the sensitivity of the plant stomata to soil job. The slope of transpiration decline, on the other hand, reflects the speed of stomata closure. But today, uh, I'm not focusing on the measurement itself, but my talk will concentrate more on the coming bottleneck, the phenotype genotype gap. So this phenotype genotype gap arises from the capacity of acquiring enormous phenomic data in the phenomics era. These data are typically spatially and temporally dynamic, but currently the genetic mapping tools cannot efficiently dissect these traits. As we know, traditional genetic mapping tools, such as the linkage mapping or association mapping, both handle static data, which means they map QTLs, underlying plant traits, each at a specific time point. So in order to map the dynamic traits, traditional genetic mapping is very time consuming and inefficient. And they disregard the internal link, internal link between the time resolved data. So it is increasingly recognized that 
there is an urgent demand to translate high throughput phenotyping into genetic gain. Recently, we proposed a joint framework called FPP-FM in order to fill the phenotype genotype gap. Here, FPP refers to functional phenotyping and FN refers to functional mapping. Functional mapping was originally proposed by Wu and Ling dating back to 2006. The basic concept of, the basic idea of functional mapping is that the expression of function value traits follows a continuous curve over time. So by combining trait modeling, genetics, and the development, developmental principle, functional mapping can dissect dynamic traits in a more efficient way and a high resolution way. So here in this chart, it shows the procedure of the joint FPP-FM. Here, through functional physiological phenotyping using advanced facilities like plant array, we can acquire dynamic quantitative physiological traits, also known as QPTs. And on the other hand, by using high throughput genotyping tools, which are very common and easy nowadays, such as genome resequencing or chip hybridization. So we can, uh, we can uh, get the uh, genome, genome wide DNA marker information. Then by incorporating trade modeling and the growth principles into the framework of functional mapping, through this functional mapping, we can easily identify dynamic QTLs, then their QTL-QTL interactions and QTL environment interactions. Here, I'm just giving an example. This is a joint study between my team and the team of Professor Menachem Moshlein from Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Here, the plant materials we used was an intra-progression line population, which was originally developed by Professor Zemmer Daniel, also from Hebrew University. Here shows the functional phenotyping by plant array for the population. So this phenotyping was performed at a very high resolution. The system recorded the transpiration data every three minutes. So here just shows um, some data from some selected lines. Here in this chart, it shows, it displays the daily weight and the daily transpiration of um, each individual lines of the integration line population. Here on the right bottom shows the fluctuations of the, trans, uh, of the transpiration rate data over a day. Um, for five selected genotypes at the well-watered drought stress and the recovery stages. These are the mathematics. Here today, I'm not giving too many details on mathematics, uh, but you can uh, refer to the star methods of our um, uh, recent publication in the iScience Journal. All the codes are available from GitHub. Here, just to show um, the most important steps. This is the modeling of the genotype specific mean vector. This is modeling the covariance matrix. And then using a maximum likelihood method, so we can test if a QTLs exist or not underline the trait variations. These are the results. Here shows the results of the data fitting. And this figure shows the result of functional mapping. As you can see here, four QDLs were identified with the, with the one with the largest effect on chromosome 11. In this figure, it clearly shows that this largest effect QTL was apparently a conditional QTL because as you can see here, the effects of the two 
alleles at this at this QTL only were differential at the water recovery stage, which means this QTLs uh, was not detectable if uh, traditional QTL mapping was performed at either the well watered stages or the drought stress stages, but it it could only be detected at the water recovery stages. So we believe its function is also tightly related to the plant recovery following water resume, water resumption, sorry. And here we can reconstruct the QTO-QTO interactions at each treatment stage. Sorry. Here, through a simulation analysis, we show that FPPFN had a higher power than uh, traditional statistical analysis, especially for the time, correla time correlated data um, at either median or high or large population size, as you can see here. So it has a much higher power. All right, next, I'm gonna give another story on jointly using um, physiological and a functional approach to dissect the uh, mechanisms behind the water conservation versus water profligation traits in two legume crops. One is cowpea and the other is soybean. So let me briefly introduce these two crops. Soybean, I think it's quite familiar to most of us. This species originates from East Asia and is considered to be quite a water profligate crop, which means it uses quite a lot of water during its growth. But on the other hand, cowpea, which originates from the dry West Africa, has been long thought to be a water conservative crop, which means it uses quite little water during its growing cycle. And the platform we used was the plant array system located in Huai'an, China. Here, let me uh, spend um, a few more time to explain the experimental design because it is critical uh, for the achievement of our goal. Here, the soybean and the cowpea plants were grown in pots uh, loaded on plant array system. But because of the different sizes of the two species, so they transport an amount of water every day, which means if we simply withhold the water to create progressive soil drought stress, uh, the uh, soil, the remnant soil water content may be different between pots. So in order to solve this problem, we implemented a feedback irrigation method to generate a homogenized progressive stress. Um, so the, the idea is that we uh, irrigate the plants with reduced amount of water based on the daily transpiration amount for each for the plants in each pot. So by doing so, we can precisely control the uh, soil water content in each pot to uh, achieve comparable and similar soil water contents between all of the pots so that the uh, shoot behaviors of water use can be compared under similar soil water stresses. In this figure, it shows um, the system weight during the whole course of experiment. In general, the experiment can be divided into the well water, mild drought, severe drought, and re water recovery stages. And here, the transpiration rate normalized to VPD, which is the vapor pressure deficiency and the plant weight was used to indicate water use behaviors. 
The system continuously and simultaneously monitor the water relations. As we can see here, under well-watered conditions, tau P showed greater WUE, which uh, was defined by the ratio between accumulated plant growth and accumulated transpiration than in soybean. And we found a more conservative water use in cow pea under well watered and early stage of drought stress, but under prolonged soil sorry under prolonged soil drought, the cow pea showed even a higher normalized transpiration rate than soybean. So these results suggest that to be conservative or to be profligate is actually um, dependent on the drought stress scenarios. Very interestingly, we observed a significant phase advancement of the maximum transpiration day, a uh, transpiration rate in a day in soybean only. So please look at this figure from the day five uh, following water withholding the peak of the daily transpiration occurred earlier for several hours in the drought stressed plants than in the CK plants. And this phase advancement got disappeared after water recovery. The next we sought to understand the gene regulatory basis underlying this uh, physiological pheno uh, phenomena. So here we perform the time series transcriptomic analysis under different job scenarios. Here, I want to um, highlight the precise sampling based on soil water contents that was enabled by plant array. So this strategy um, is in contrast to the traditional sampling strategies, which usually based on the treatment day. But here, because we can monitor the soil water contents and the plant physiological status in a real time manner, so we can precisely sample the plant leaves at intended soil water contents or drought stress levels to ensure that the comparison between different pots were made under similar drought stress stresses. So three time points a day, we sample the leaves and through a differential expression analysis, we identified around 16% and around 20% of the unique cowpea and soybean genes as differentially expressed. We found that time of day had an impact on both crops and showed complex interactions with the drought scenario. So as you can see here, under the mild drought condition at 6 a.m., there were very few cowpea genes were differentially expressed between the stressed and the well-watered plants. But at 12 p.m., much, much more cowpea genes responded to stress. So, so this shows an apparent interaction between the time of day and the job stress. We also look at the patterns of the top DEG, DEGs, which means the genes that showed um, the greatest fold of transcriptional abundance changes. In Calpin, among the top DEGs include the tip 2-3, Aquaporin genes, the PP2C ABA signaling genes. But in uh, soybean, there are several flower genes among the top genes, which are associated with uh, cell wall. So the top gene patterns are very different between the two species. A gene ontology enrichment analysis showed that photosynthesis and the stress responses were enriched in soybean, but not in cowpea under mild drought. But as the soil drought 
became more severe, the GO enrichment patterns became more similar between two species. So these results highlights a dehydration avoidance mechanism in cowpea under mild job, which uh, is consistent with the physiological, physiologically water conservative traits in uh, cowpea because this water conservation trait will um, lead to a less water loss, so a less perturbated uh, soil uh, leaf water status in cowpea. Because time of day plays an important, uh, had, an, had an interaction with the drought stress, then we sought to see if certain uh, circadian clock genes were involved in this process. So through a bioinformatical analysis, we identified 32 and 44 clock genes from the cowpea and the soybean genome, respectively. And through anal analyzing the uh, RNA-seq data, we found that all the logs of the ELF3 like 4, RVE, CHE, and the ZTL genes, they showed species and the jaw strength dependent transcriptional regulations. We then performed a weighted, um, weighted a gene co-expression network analysis, which identified two modules each from the two crops as significantly associated with the transpiration rate trait. And we also noted that the module 17 in CalP was negatively correlated with the, so, uh, with the soybean module 14 module. So this may partly explain the quite contrasting physiological phenotypes uh, in, in the two crops under similar soil jobs. We identified five and eight hub genes from the two transpiration associated expression co-expression modules and the 26 and the nine hub genes from the two soybean TR associated co-expression modules. From these hub genes, one gene each drew our particular interest. Let me explain why. As you can see here, the TPS9 gene also log in uh, CalP, the VU TPS9, it showed elevated expression um, under drought, but it remained quite stable in soybean. The CYP, the cytochrome 707A4 genes expression patterns were, were even more amazing because as you can see here, its expression was high in cowpea under well watered conditions. But its expression got upregulated and downregulated, respectively, in soybean and the cowpea. This gene encodes an ABA degrading enzyme. So we assume that the higher basal level of this gene may contribute to the higher level of and a lower level of um, uh, ABA uh, in the cowpea, but the lower level, the lower level of this gene under mild drought may contribute to the higher level of ABA in cowpea and the lower level of ABA in soybean. We know ABA, the effect of ABA is to help stomach closure. So this differential expression at uh, mild drought conditions may partly, un, un, uh, partly explain the uh, relatively water conservative versus profligate uh, water use strategies in the two species. Next, we select the VUTPS9 gene for functional validation because this gene was identified to be a class two TPS gene whose function has never been validated before in any species. So here, uh, through transient overexpression in the leaves of cowpea, 
uh, and subjected the plants to 50% uh, or 10% PEG treatment to mimic the different strengths of osmotic stresses. We found that transpiration rate and uh, stomach conductance were more sensitive in the VUTPS9 overexpression lines than in the C case. As shown here, as shown here the overexpression line had more closed stomata and the lower transpiration rate. So these results confirmed that VUTPS9 functions to help water saving uh, in uh, CalP. Now, taken together, we uh, proposed a tentative model to, to uh, summarize the mechanisms of the water profligate versus conservative uh, water use strategies. This model includes the interplay among crop type, drought scenario, and the time of day, which underlie water conservative versus profligate traits. Several important genes, such as the VU Pona Plus Aquaporin gene, the TPS9 gene, the Cytochrome 707A4 gene, and the GM the soybean flour genes are among the highly interesting responsible genes. And the several um, gene ontology terms like photosynthesis, redox, homeostasis are highly interesting biological processes or pathways underline these differential water use strategies. Um, so uh, let me close my talk with this uh, final slide to describe the coupled phenogeno-functional approach. So this has not been published yet. Um, so here in this approach, we use high throughput physiological phenotyping to acquire uh, plant phenotypes and environmental parameters. So this phenotyping can be implemented with feedback control to precisely uh, control the process or the speed of um, the drought progress. Through this phenotyping, we can acquire primary traits. And by combining the primary traits and the environmental parameters, we can derive complex traits, such as the critical soil water content. These traits then can, can be deeply analyzed by modeling either mathematic models or process-based models to uh, gain curve-fitting parameters or genotype-independent model parameters. So these phenotypic traits or the inferred pr model parameters then can be implemented into the one-step functional mapping to identify dynamic genetic determin determinants. And the QTL dynamic effects as well as the QTL network can be reconstructed using the functional mapping approach. Once an interesting QTL is identified, then we can precisely sample the plant tissues based on their physiological or the soil water status to to gain highly biologically meaningful plant samples for functional analysis. Multi-omics, such as phenomics, uh, sorry, such as um, uh, transcriptomics, proteomics can be uh, combined with phenomics and the genomics. And uh, all sets of functional tools like uh, gene editing, trans transgenic, RNA interference, all kinds of functional tools can be implemented into the uh, validation to finally get a comprehensive picture of the phenogenal functional um, aspects of the plant traits. So finally, I wish to thank all the people I work with there are um, Professor Menahem Moshelan from Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Professor Rongling Wu from 
Pennsylvania State University, Dr. Li Bo Jiang, uh, who is a former lecturer at the Beijing Forage University and currently a professor at the Shandong um, Science and Technology University. Also, my collaborators at the Huai'an Academy of Agricultural Sciences, where our plant array system uh, uh, is located. These studies were financially supported by the National Science Foundation of China, the National Key Research and Development Program of China, as well as um, some uh, spe uh, special fundings to uh, talents. Also, I wish to thank Plant Ditech and BioZero, the two companies who helped us, who have been helped us uh, running the uh, plant array system and provide technical support for any problems. Thank you very much for your patience. And once again, apologize for the technical issues occurred uh, at the beginning of my talk. Uh, I will be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zhu. Uh, very, very interesting uh, talk, uh, very interesting approaches there where you combined uh, phenomics, genomics and physiological approaches, um, so to say, in a plant systems approach. And if I if I had to summarize it, I would probably do call it a plant systems approach to identifying the expression um, regulation of genes in order to find QTLs um, in response to environmental factors. Is that more or less uh, is that more or less correct, or did I misunderstand uh, something? I think you are very correct. <laughs> Thank you. Very good. <laughs> that was quite an effort. So I would like to um, open um, the discussion. For questions, um, as I said, you can uh, post the questions in the chat, and uh, I would lead with uh, maybe the first uh, first question from my side in order to give the um, audience a little bit of time to phrase their questions. Um, in um, one of your slides, uh, sliders, um, slides, um, I saw. Um, yeah, that you spoke about um, phenomics data in um, their quality to, to depict certain traits in their function of time. Mm -hmm. yes. um, but certainly these traits vary not only by time, so um, for various reasons, given the plant ontology, for example, so the development of a plant, of course, that has a timely um, aspect, um, but also in the duration, for example, of, uh, of, a, of a treatment. Mm -hmm. In the function, uh, in the physiological functional approach, you showed that you normalized or you said that you normalized a uh, transpiration rate to a vapor pressure deficit and uh, plant size. Plant weight. Yes. yes. Or, or a plant weight. Yes. Right. Sorry. Sorry for that. Um, was plant weight a surrogate for biomass and hence for um, for um, for leaf area? Biomass. Yeah, for biomass. Yeah. So because because uh, transpiration often is is coupled with. Uh, with with of course leaf area so the more leaf area the more canopy you have um the the higher is the transpiration in comparison to um lesser leaf area or lesser um, um canopy complexity so the biomass was more or less the the, the surrogate for leaf area yes so let me explain this a bit more so the uh, our system uh, provides a whole plant solution, and it uh, does not measure uh, the plant area, but it measures the um, system weight change. So all the parameters, um, all the parameters, uh, we 
car from the system were based on the weight change. So here we use the, the um, a biomass scan to, uh, to reflect the uh, effect of plant size as an approximate. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, yes, indeed. Some uh, researchers may also want to see the uh, data of the plant uh, leaf area. And I agree that with this data, uh, definitely it can provide uh, some better understanding. So, but uh, using a single system like the plant array, we, we can uh, get the biomass uh, data. So that's why we, we are actually helping in the efforts of uh, integrating the uh, lysimity based system like plan array with the imaging system to integrate different types of uh, parameters to better reflect the uh, uh, different aspects of the plant and biology. Yes, yes, I think, um... I think the more refined the um, input parameters are, the more um, targeted will, of course, results also be. So I would be very interested to find out what will happen to your model if you, for example, um, replace or, or, or to this functional approach, if you uh, replace um, one, one parameter like plant biomass with a similar parameter like uh, leaf area but uh, of course I, I acknowledge that uh, the the the, uh, the setup only provides so much data and uh, certainly you have made quite an effort uh, and um, valuable results as well with uh, the functional approach as it is all right yes. so uh, looking at the chat there's not too many questions there Again, uh, I'd like to uh, appeal to the audience if there are any questions for uh, Professor Zeus' talk, please post them now. Otherwise, I will be I will be uh, coming up with more questions. So, Professor Zhu, you have been ah, there is one from uh, Dr. Seba Kuas from uh, Tunisia. And uh, I think he, he is asking, how does VUTPS9 involved in the transpiration regulation rate? And can you explain the increase of GNCYP in soybean under drought? I will send this, oh no, you can see this questions in the, in the chat window. If you go to the control panel and click on chat. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and see. maybe it's more clearer if you can read it along. How does TB, ah, uh, how does, can you explain the increase? It's already been, okay, okay. So yeah, thanks for this uh, good question, Dr. Coas. So, for your first question, how does VUTBS9 involve in the transpiration regulation rate? Actually, we uh, don't know because we didn't investigate on the uh, molecular mechanism of how this gene control the transpiration regulation, but we just did a transgenic validation. But uh, we, you know, the uh, uh, functional annotation of this gene is like a trehalus. It is a trehalus synthesis gene. Um, although the exact function of uh, the exact working mechanism of this gene uh, has not been clear, but some of its um, homolog genes, like the VP, uh, like the TPS six gene, uh, has been well. Uh, studied in some uh, model plants. I think it can uh, change the level of the cellular trehalus and to serve as a signal to change the uh, stomatal conductance. So, but this is my guess. Although I, I believe it is quite the case, but uh, we, we didn't, uh, didn't investigate into that. And then the second one, can I explain the increase of the G GM cytochrome gene? I think, I think the CYP gene. So you mean the cytochrome seven O seven A four gene? So if if it is, 
Uh, I think the, uh, the, un the answer is easy because this gene encodes an ABA degrading gene. So which means a higher level of this gene would result in a lower amount of ABA. So under job, under job condition, the uh, under mild job, I would say under the mild job, the soybean may uh, increase its level of um, a cytochrome gene to partly degrade the ABA so that the plant can um, use more of the water during these mild drought conditions. This is how the water profligate plants usually do. So they even transpire in a, a, in a higher rate during mild drought to uh, grow more quickly. So I think um, this is the uh, explanation, but, uh, but same, we didn't, uh, we didn't uh, measure the uh, exact ABA content because during our experiment, you know, we didn't know this gene was transcriptional regulated. So it, is, it was not logic for us to uh, intentionally to measure ABA content or to measure uh, any the uh, the contents of any of the metabol metabolisms encoded by a specific gene. So only after we finished the uh, transcriptomic analysis could we find this gene of interest. But we uh, we had we have we had actually you know lost the opportunity to uh, to perform some uh, like a, a downstream analysis. So that was quite a pity actually. Yeah, I don't know if uh, my reply satisfies you, but we can discuss anyway. <clears throat> All right, further questions? If not, I would, ah, there's another, the transfer. Ah, okay, you can uh, see it. Anyhow, I'm gonna read it out loud um, for our viewers. The transpira transpiration regulation is the important mechanism for the selection of tolerant species to water deficit. I think the osmotic adjustment and the accumulation of proline and glucine mm -hmm. is important. Yes, I, yes, yes, I partly agree. Um, the uh, osmotic adjustment and also the proline glycine, so they are also, they contribute to the osmotic adjustment. The osmotic adjustment definitely um, is, uh, is part of the mechanism underlying the uh, drought resistance because they pro, uh, provide a protective uh, mechanism. But the transpiration regulation um, the I think I think these two types of mechanisms they they can be considered as working at different levels to protect the plants from uh, suffering some uh, severe uh, defects is the main reason of osmotic adjustment. But the transpiration regulation is like a a more active way to prevent water loss. So I think they're complementary, but not uh, like a contradictory. They both are important. So if the transpira transpiration regulation works efficiently, there might not be uh, the need for osmotic adjustment, you mean? Uh, yes, I think partly, but they also they got, uh, kind of overlap. And the, uh, you know, the transpiration regulation is really dependent on the uh, the drought, drought scenario, so it, it changes over time, over uh, during the course of the experiment. Uh, I think it is there are still a lot of researchers need to need to do to uh, more clearly understand the relationship with, between these different mechanisms. Actually, there are even more mechanisms underlying the uh, uh, drought adaptation, um, like uh, you know, some like a uh, uh, uh per, some other protective mechanisms, some uh, uh, oxi uh, redox oxidation, or even some energy uh, er energy flow. They are interlinked anyway. 
Mm -hmm. So I think it, you know, it, it sometimes it depends on from which perspective we want to um, understand the mechanism. So each any single experiment on a single perspective is can just uh, you know provide a quite limited uh, insight. Yeah, only a snap snapshot for the given conditions in this uh, single experiment. Ah. Yeah, um, as it is uh, appears, um, drought response is very, very um, complex in terms of physiology. Um, and of course, it does not get better if we want to in, um, observe drought effects during different developmental stages of a plant. Yes. Yes. Have, what what ex, what are your experiences here, um, or what have you worked on um, for most of your experiments? Did you concentrate on adult plants, or did you also investigate drought effects on juvenile uh, plants before the grain uh, filling or before the the harvesting? Uh, in our system. We uh, because these experiments usually last for quite a long time, over like a one month, you know, because um, because the um, in China we are located in Hangzhou, China, which is uh, quite a uh, southern part of China, and it's quite uh, humid. So the uh, evaporation rate is not that high. So we usually start the water withholding for the plants um, before the grain filling or the pot em emerging stage. But the study usually ends uh, at the stage of uh, post grain filling. Mm -hmm. But it, it also depends on the, uh, the local climate, like in Israel or in like uh, California, Southern California. So the, the experiment can last much shorter because of the high VPD and a, a better um, su uh, sunlight. So in our experiences, and also for our uh, legume crops, like uh, common bean, cowpea, uh, we, we usually use the uh, plants, uh, quite young plants, but not seedlings, definitely. All right. Thank you. Um, the next question comes from Todd Deswan. Um, he's asking, was nodulating rhizobacteria included in your soy and cowpea study? If so, can you infer any differences in the drought tolerance of the plant rhizobacteria relationship in cowpea versus soy plants? Very good question. Yes, the rhizo rhizobium bacteria I think they definitely exist in our experiments, but we uh, we never consider them. Um, but the system can also be useful for this type of study, because you can use different types of um, rhizo bacteria. You can supplement different types of them into the substrate to compare the plant performances. Uh, you can also investigate the, the joint, the combined effect of drought and the, the micro microorganisms. Uh, so it's theoretically it's feasible, but we, we haven't done this before. All right. So I'd like to uh, close the discussion for now and thank you very much, uh, Professor Zhu, for this very, very interesting talk. I'd like to uh, highlight that uh, in the coming weeks and days, um, IPPL will launch a special issue uh, that is uh, inspired by the just re recently finished IPPS in Wacheningen and will be uh, open for anyone to submit. So um, 
please uh, stay tuned for any news. Uh, there will also be a uh, newsletter uh, at the end of this year coming out from IPPN and highlighting this opportunity for researchers in the phenomics uh, space to use this special issue as a venue for their research. Once again, I want to thank you, Professor Pei Zhu from Jiliang University for today's webinar. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much for providing this good opportunity. And thank you for all the audiences who are interested. Thanks for the, uh, yes, thanks uh, also going out to the audience. And uh, be sure if you missed this webinar or parts of this webinar to hit it up on YouTube. Uh, it will be uploaded within the next few days. Thank you, Professor Zhu, and um, I hope to see you in person at some point. Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah, we will meet in person. Very good. Thank you and have a good rest of the week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.